on the phone, Professor Claremont McKenna College, Willie Geismer, author of Don't Blame Us, Suburban Liberals and the Transformation of the Democratic Party. Uh, Professor, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, now, I'm going to do my best. This is a, um, you're, you're tracking a, the sort of, I guess, the rightward tack by the Democratic Party over the past 30, 40 years, I guess. Um, and you look at five suburban communities in Massachusetts as a way of illustrating um, what, uh, where the Democratic Party has gone. So let me first just say that I'm going to do my best as a uh, Worcester native to try and keep my accent in check as we talk about these communities. Because uh, I don't want to slip into my, my parody of my Massachusetts accent at any time. So with that uh, up front, um, talk about, let's start with Don't Blame Us, because I remember this as as a kid, frankly. Um, where did the title Don't Blame Us come from? So the title comes from a bumper sticker that appeared in Massachusetts after uh, the election of George McGovern, after the election of Richard Nixon. Um, in 1972, where Nixon won um, every state but Massachusetts. So George McGovern won the state of Massachusetts. And it's a bumper sticker in reference to that. It's a don't, blame, don't blame me, I'm from, from Massachusetts. And then also it appeared after Watergate. And so it became a symbol of how the state of Massachusetts sort of stands against the national tide as this sort of this bastion of liberalism and the increased, um, the sort of increased conservatism of the rest of the country and kind of as a, as a sort of sense of self righteousness against the rest of the, everyone else who voted for Nixon. And, and I, I, mean, I think it's fair to say that your, your, your book argues that um, both uh, McGovern actually, in many respects, shifted where the Democratic Party was heading in many ways, and that, in fact, um, that moment signaled where, uh, I guess, the idea of Massachusetts liberals, not necessarily so liberal, or as liberal as I think we sort of imagined them to be. Yeah, so the idea of the title was sort of to, in many ways, challenge that assumption of the state into the kind of fashion of American liberalism and to think about how it's not actually exceptional, but a model for larger transformations that have happened within, um, within the Democratic Party and then national politics as a whole. And so some of it is it's not, it's not necessarily a rightward shift um, as much as a kind of um, uh, the argument that I make is that it's a more of a, um, a shift in its the sort of class allegiances and location, sort of away from the more labor-oriented working class, who are the base of the Democratic Party for much of the 20th century, towards a more sort of suburban-oriented um, base um, of kind of engineers and knowledge workers and people like that who are more on the suburban periphery. And that's going to happen in, in Massachusetts. So I trace that trend, but the other, the other question um, is, thinking about McGovern, who often sort of is famous for the idea that he sort of for the three A's of um, amnesty, abortion, and acid, and that he actually was um, at the forefront of a type of, of Democratic Party politics that was that was appealing to these kinds of voters on issues of high tech, the environment, those, um, and sort of quality of life issues. And um, I also look at the same thing with Michael Dukakis, who has also been sort of um, lambasted as a Massachusetts liberal, and these the, the, these policies set an a set of agenda and sort of um, and strategies um, actually actually anticipate what the um, where the party is go, is going, and so Obama uses a very similar, and, and Clinton and I use a very similar strategy. Um, so you can see you can track these, but. The, trend happening over a longer period. I mean, let's, I, I want to, I mean, let, let's, let's, let's clarify too this idea of, because I think um, I, I say right word and I'm saying right word, I guess, in terms of, of the Democratic Party, in terms of, I guess, uh, an economic perspective, right? I mean, it, 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 specifically in the orientate, in the question of of race, because I mean, excuse me, race in terms of the question of, of money, um, and um, as opposed to 
more, I guess, socially liberal um, um, uh, uh, things. And I mean, is that is that a fairly accurate assessment? Yeah, and I, I think this is where it's so hard to sort of identify labels of, of right and left and where this particular constituency is a, is a great way to think about that because on, on many of the sort of traditional social issues that they um, that, that they're um, would be considered less. I mean, sort of env- environment, um, affirmative action to some degree. Um, they're very opposed to the Vietnam War, but are um, very fiscally moderate. And particularly, and I think this is where you see um, where the where the, demo- the my argument is about the, the larger Democratic Party uh, with this group of people as their major constituency. It helps explain some of the party's um, lack of sort of particularly addressing more structurally based um, solutions to, to economic problems and to racial problems. And so that's some of the, the, how and why those, those issues have not fully been addressed by the party. There are other factors too, but this is a sort of key, a key piece in it. So they tend to be particularly, um, the, the set of this constituency, very um, individually focused. Um, and so that's a key part of my argument is to sort of suggest that they they tend to be the most liberal on issues that are the furthest away from their uh, their um, property values, tax rates, and kids' education. Yeah, at one point so, you write, I know that. At one point you write, I guess this is in the, um, <laughs> excuse me, in the um, in your introduction, <clears throat> you write, suburban liberals achieved the greatest victories in campaigns that proposed individualist situ- solutions to rights-related issues required limited financial sacrifice and offered tangible quality of life benefits. I mean, this has been a uh, <coughs> a, a critique of, of liberals that I've heard for at least uh, 20 or 30 years. I think, you know, Mort Saul was talking about everybody's a liberal until it costs them a dime. And uh, on this program, we've had uh, Fran Leibowitz talk about the problem of liberalism is a moneyed one. And um, it the... It, and on some level, I think you're suggesting, or well, your research uh, shows that that part of this is a function of of this migration to uh, to suburbia. I mean, is that is that it? Because you adopt different set of values there. Yeah, I mean, I think particularly in the suburbs that there's a that um, the, the, the and, and so this has been the history of mass suburbanization in the United States, but it's put a strong emphasis on um, on especially property values and the sort of importance of home ownership and that those kinds of that set of sort of individual values that come with um, with the politics of, of home ownership breeds breeds this kind of liberalism. And so I think that that's some of the what I wanted to look at is the ways in which that that emphasis on suburban the, the experience of living in the suburbs can, can reshape these larger sort of political questions and it sort of and really it's about the sort of suburbanization of liberalism. That as, as more and more liberals are living in a suburb, how is actually seeing their values? And it, I mean, is it is it is it? I mean, I guess you know, it's I, I don't know how relevant it is to question whether or not it is the, they're still maintaining their perspective as liberals on some level. I, I don't know. I mean, they're certainly not leftists. Um, I mean, just what's your sense of that? I mean, uh, just in terms of the nomenclature. Yeah, well, I think, and that was something I really struggled with, was what term to call, but there are a lot of other terms that get identified to this particular group of people. Um, and I, I picked up the word suburban liberal, which is actually what they call themselves, and they sort of see themselves very much in line with, um, as, as liberal. So it's not, it's not left, and it's not, they wouldn't call themselves conservative either. And I think this is that hard question of how to define, I mean, I think that this is a struggle with how to define liberalism, but they, I, they're not, and there is a uh, really, um, like, research looks at uh, a lot of political activism that was going on within these suburban communities. I mean, a lot of the, it's a, it's a lot of the people um, who live there got really involved in civil rights groups. Yeah, I want to get to I want to get to to those those actions uh, in in a bit. I mean, and, and they certainly when you hear the the activism, it is again sort of primarily focused on. What we perceive as socially liberal, um, uh, I guess, goals. Um, and yeah, I guess, and I. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's interesting because you know, I uh, like I say, I grew up in Massachusetts, uh, and the uh, one of the things that struck me about your book was just sort of remembering Proposition Two and a Half 
which came in in the early 80s, which um, was sort of, I guess, adopted from a similar um, law in California, which basically capped, if I remember correctly, the property taxes uh, or a cap the amount of property taxes that would be spent on public school. And I remember, like, I think it was, you know, in, in, in when I entered in high school, all of a sudden, like, everything was cut. Like, like everything was cut, like literally one quarter to one third of what was in that school the year before was just gone. And um, that to me does not, you know, you hear this notion of you come from liberal Massachusetts and meanwhile they're destroying public education because they don't want to pay property taxes. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And I should say my Massachusetts roots come out that I interrupt people. Um, it always comes up in California, so I apologize for that. But I think... What I described is to my students in California where the tax of Proposition 13 and the tax revolt gets so much attention. There's an idea that Proposition 2 and a half sounds like it was the lesser tax revolt, but it actually was uh, having a 2.5% cap on property taxes, which passed in 1980, was an incredibly stringent um, law and I think has, has fundamentally defined a lot of the sort of these fiscally oriented politics. And I think that's one of those places of thinking about how, what, exactly what you said, how the state um, this doesn't necessarily gel with the state's image, but where it really is on the forefront of, of American politics, and it, it um, helps in um, Michael Dukakis's um, effective economic turnaround of the state, which then leads to his nomination for the Democratic presidency in 1988. So it has these larger effects, but I think that but at a, at a nationally, and then it affected people at their day-to-day life, that you're, you had a lot of the, the programs cut from your school, um, and it highlights some of these kinds of fiscal politics. And let me ask you, before we actually dig into these five communities and, and talk about the sort of the history of these, um, of their, of the, um, of the political activism there, again, let me ask you just again, sort of more broadly as to like, why, how can you be so sure when you do this research that, um, that these communities are representative? I mean, one thing that I've always found stuff about Massachusetts uh, pol- uh, politics to be strange insofar as like, you know, I, if I remember correctly, uh, it took a long time to get the seatbelt law passed in Massachusetts. Just people <laughs> really had a problem with that. And there's just a very strange mix of, of, of parochialism in Massachusetts, to my experience, um, and, you know, granted, I'm coming from, from Worcester, and which is, you know, incredibly parochial, I think, for the size of the city. Um, and there's weird sort of race issues in Massachusetts um, that, that, I guess, seem stranger just because it has a different reputation. Well, I think that's where the, a lot of the ways that the state's reputation and security is larger realities and so why it's what why it's such a sort of rich fight for thinking about um, larger political change and so some of the some of the things about um partic- I mean particularly you know, so I think some of the protocols are comfortable to church and roots but also the large amount of Catholics are in the state. And I will say I was I've been so, I was um, surprised to learn having grown up there at the the large church are very liberal Catholics. Um, in Massachusetts, to actually shape liberal politics, but there's a whole other tradition that I think does shape a certain amount of parochialism. And then the other big question is this, the issue of race, which was one that really inspired me to be interested in the topic in the first place, which is how do you have the, the same, so you have George McGovern winning um, only the state of Massachusetts and it's this fashion of liberalism, and then two years later is the, the Boston busing crisis erupts, um, which is considered the kind of the most violent act sort of racial confrontation of the 1970s and sort of earn the, the thoughts and adaptation of, of the Little Rock of the North. And so how, that, there, that those don't, aren't, there's a way of explaining how those two things are linked. And so that was some of what I wanted to understand. Well, um, let's, as well. let's, I mean, let's, let's look at, I mean, uh, tell us the, um, the, the five communities that you look at, and then we, and I want to get to that sort of the way that that McGovern, um, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the juxtaposition of the McGovern victory versus um, the the busing, but um, you cover five communities that are on 128, and I spent a lot of time riding on 128 uh, 
many times. I had friends in Gloucester and friends down in the Cape, and uh, so there was a lot of time spent on 128. But that is a, it, it's an interesting, it's the big tech corridor in Massachusetts. Why those five communities and how do those communities sort of manifest this new, and we should say also, I guess before we even go into this, that the reason why these, um, it's not just that these are indicative of a change in the, the sort of the, um, the demographics of the, of, the, of the Democratic Party, but they're also an incredibly powerful they have more power than they may have numbers, right, in terms of the demographics within the Democratic Party? Is that a fair assessment? Yes. And so one of the things, one of the pieces of my argument is to say that this is a group of people, and so suburban liberals are, and like the kind of people I study are demographically quite small, but they hold a tremendous amount of power. Um, and so even and even within, and just because of their, for a number of different reasons, that they're sort of, um, they're both, sort of intellectual capital and political capital and economic capital give them a particular kind of power. And so the reason I picked the towns I did, so Route 128 is the, is the kind of Silicon Valley of Massachusetts. And actually in the 50s and 60s, it was, the, it was, a, it, sur- it surpassed Silicon Valley as the kind of tech corridor in the United States. And the, the communities I look at, um, the, the, it's the towns of Concord, Lexington, Newton, Lincoln, and Brookline, and so those towns will have some, hopefully have some residents of people, even if they aren't having some a lot of time in Massachusetts, uh, as sort of these historic communities, but in the 1950s and 60s, they get a, there's a huge migration of um, new residents who move there, largely who have ties to, um, who either went to Harvard or MIT, and have ties to this kind of tech, tech or academic world that's emerging. And so the the question I have that I look, I look at sort of how this migration of kind of these new sort of knowledge workers to these communities, which have a reputation of being sort of old historic communities, becomes a sort of um, becomes a real sort of um, cauldron of a new kind of liberalism that emerges. And it, it's I'm using these this, this is a, a similar kind of trend emerges across the country, but it's particularly pronounced in Massachusetts um, because of the kind of um, for historical factors, and then also because of this, the, the rise of this sort of post-industrial economy. Um, and the reason I picked the towns I, the, is they were the ones that sort of, I, I, there was a particular set of political issues that I was interested in pursuing, and they were the towns that most most um, clearly identified them. And I, I in some ways, I actually that a little bit because I've been going the Massachusetts, I knew that these were, these were communities that had strong reputations of being very liberal um, and, and very, and, and extraordinarily, and the other thing is extraordinarily affluent, too. So that's sort of a feature of them that they, um, and the, one of the things I sort of t- talked about in the book, building on this idea of kind of exceptionalism, is that they're all communities that don't look like traditional suburbs. There's a lot of the idea that we're not like the sort of mass produced suburbs, um, but that also may, means that they're, that, that makes them even, um, more affluent. And so most of the towns have a one acre minimum lot zoning policies. Um, so, and, and you no, know, and have very stringent, Building codes, you can't have a, you can't have anything other than a um, single family home on a large plot of land. And which, which necessarily, yeah. which does both, which sort of uh, does both those things, right? Like we're not going to allow for, you know, suburban sprawl on one hand, and on the other hand, we're also not going to allow for people who aren't that wealthy to live here. Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. And so the the question that I have, and so looking at the sort of confrontation of these issues, is that a lot of these communities are very active. A lot of people move there who have liberal values and get really involved in the issue of um, their housing and um, and um, voluntary integration for school. But there's big conflicts that emerge when um, when you go beyond when when the towns try to go beyond that and, and bring in affordable housing in the 1970s. And so there's incredibly fierce battles in these communities um, over the construction of affordable housing. Yeah. Um, and I use that as a kind of way to think about those tensions. Yeah, I mean, that's what's sort of fascinating about this. I mean, and, and it, it, there, you know, I mean, I think I, I feel like I grew up with that. Um, my step-grandfather was uh, very, um, uh, you know, sort of very based in sort of like these arm's length of notion of, uh, in terms of race. Of, of, of what was a pro, what was right and that, that, that people deserved equal rights, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He was very, very explicit about that. And then would also say, you know, but, uh, I don't like these people. 
and, uh, and, and so there was sort of always that sort of like weird, I mean, I remember when he, I guess at one point felt I was old enough to understand that, uh, and I was really taken aback, but to some level that really sort of explains a lot of what we see with these, uh, communities, which is a, a an intense sense of like, there must be justice, just not in this specific environment around where I'm living. Yeah, and so my argument is that, is absolutely what you described, is that, um, that the part that there has to be justice and equal rights is liberal. I mean, those are in some ways, those are, those are all mine with traditional liberal values, but the other part of it is this idea of as long as it doesn't affect my property values or tax rates, or, tax rates, or, or particularly um, my kids, and I, I think it's a lot of it has to do with my kids' education, so anything that's going to sort of affect the, the quality of, of those things, um, that, and that's where you see the line drawn. And, and, I, and my argument is that that's not, that's, that's not a contradiction. That's actually where the, that's what the goal has become. And, and you also, I mean, the, the other issues you talk about are, um, well, I mean, you talk about, I mean, I, I guess to a certain extent they all sort of, um, they meld together, at least like civil rights and environmentalism sort of, it, I guess intersect at that notion of like, well, we want to protect the environment. We don't want this urban sprawl. It also has the uh, the, the benefit of sort of maintaining a uh, homogeneous quality to our community. And um, and talk about you also mentioned uh, you also I guess uh, have a, a chapter on on feminism and on peace. Uh, in, in regards particularly to the Vietnam War. Talk about those issues and how, uh, again, they manifest this sort of, I guess you could call it dichotomy. Yeah, well, so so one of the things that's amazing is that this, the other component of suburban liberals is that they're, for the people I say, is that they're incredibly um, effective politically. And so I think one thing, both are demographically small, but I, one thing I've learned is that it's from suburban politics is that a small group of people can actually have a tremendous amount of um, power if they're mobilized, and so they work really well to get a lot of legislation passed on these particular issues. And so, in environmentalism, they, they help sort of Massachusetts get some of the more um, more um, wide-reaching environmental laws in the country. But it's especially around the issues of open space, um, and that's about kind of in, in a town like Concord. Um, today, a fourth of the town is under um, is under some sort of conservation from either the state, local, or private land. Or private private foundations, um, which makes it really hard to build anything new. Um, so in some ways, that is about protecting the ball, but that also makes it extraordinarily exclusive. So that's a way of thinking about the sort of individualist and material components of environmental politics. Um, and so some of it is to sort of think about how all of these things become a link and to sort of think about the individual dimensions of a lot of the kind, these kinds of political issues. And so feminism is another one where in the 70s, many of the communities become um, really at the forefront of, of, of um, pushing for feminism. Feminism but it's a lot about the sort of ideas of um, race-based feminism and, um, and ideas of choice um, and not a more collective vision of, of feminist politics. Um, so that would, that would address a larger range of, of women's experiences, um, especially around race and class. And so I use, think about all of these things together to think about that dichotomy of sort of, 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 of the, the driving force of sort of, in, of, of thinking about equality, but then as a couple with sort of a profound amount of individualism. So, so when we're talking about in terms of feminism, so uh, let me just to, I guess, to reiterate and, and see if I understand that we're talking you see a big push in terms of, of, of choice, like you said, but um, what, what accounts for the fact that there, it's not, is it, is it simply because, you know, uh, questions of where feminism intersects with race and intersects with class, you don't hear much coming from these people because they're white and rich, essentially? Uh, yeah. No, I think, I mean, I think some of it is not, I mean, it's not, and that is the thing of not, like, the, the question of political blaming works in a couple of different ways. And I, and one of my arguments is that, like, how much do these people, so many of this with the people, it, there's a certain a level of sort of well-meaningness to a lot of the, the, the kinds of politics and really genuine commitment, but they're, that they um, largely live in all-white, exclusive communities. And so I think that that is, that is a huge frame of reference in a lot of different ways, that they're not always accustomed to thinking about the, the variety of different experiences of people 
people and so there's often this very sort of middle class suburban based vision shaped by their own experiences are these the soccer moms I mean, are these just soccer moms? Like, we, you know, we don't hear so much about them. I don't know why we haven't heard so much about them in this room. But is, it, is this, I mean, when we, took, when we used to hear about soccer moms, I think it was maybe in 2008, uh, is, this, is this who we're talking about? I don't think, I think it's less, I think it's a more, um, a more sort of politicized version of a soccer mom. And I'm trying to think of a kind of, if there's a, if there's a corollary. I mean, I think that, it, and one of the things I talked about at the end is I think there's a lot of the same people who now that who actually now live in more urban-based communities. Right. Um, there's been a huge shift, and so it's more um, like the kind of the, the that that that's more where the activism has merged. So I think that it's a, it's a more um, because I think the idea of soccer, the soccer moms are swing voters, and these aren't swing; these are either sort of more committed to um, it's with the Democratic Party nationally. And more issue-based activists. Is this? I mean, it, on some level, does this sort of? I, I guess these suburban liberals who are sort of knowledge-based. It, it, is this? Is the creative class there? I guess their kids who are just not making quite as much money, uh, <laughs> but uh, living in uh, you know in Brooklyn or in uh, I guess now in in JP in Boston. Yeah. No, absolutely. Exactly, and so in or um, Silver Lake, where I live in LA, um, the the um, it, I, that's the, those are the that's very much I think where this has shifted, and I think a lot of those the, the question that in a lot of those communities is, is a similar thing of we don't live in we don't live in the sort of typical suburbs. You see that same kind of sort of sense of, of we want certain high quality of life, but it's a similar set of kind of um, individual values. So I think it's very much a kind of the anticipation of the creative uh, creative class. And so, and, and um, which, which is deeply individualistic and sort of meritocratic in a lot of ways. But is it more? Is the is the creative class slightly more? I guess, um, and I'll use the word progressive because I'm talking about economic issues. Because a, they're not doing as well as their parents. Uh, b, they're living in an urban environment, and so the. Um, the, the sort of the calculations are different. They're not as necessarily um, focused on, you know, that one acre. Uh, because I'm trying to get a sense of, like, Obama, and I think you made this argument, uh, reflects this, the sort of the culmination on some level of those suburban liberals, which is why sometimes what he does is mystifying to liberals more broadly speaking. I mean, is that is that also fair? Or? Yeah, well, I think I think the, the Obama component, the Obama won an overwhelming number of, of people in the tech industry, and so a lot of the people with the creative, in the creative class are, are have some sort of loose connection to sort of tech-oriented jobs. And, um, and even though they're not living on an acre, uh, acre plot of land, buying an apartment in, or buying a condo in Silver Lake is almost comparable in price. So I think that there's a similar, you see a similar kind of, um, a, a similar kind of, um, sort of class-based identity emerging. And, um, and, a, and, a, and it has actually had similar effects in that it's, it's driven out, um, it's driven out a lot of low-income residents from various different communities, and there's the same thing. There's this solution of living in, in living in urban areas that hasn't, hasn't been served in a solution. And the other thing is that this has been a driving force in shaping larger kind of redevelopment patterns in that there's a huge amount of emphasis on kind of bringing um, the same kind of tech-oriented jobs that, that first brought people out to the suburbs um, and companies the companies are right in are now moving into Boston. There's this, this huge redevelopment of the seaport area. Um, I know this, is, this has happened in um, cities across the country, and so it's this, um, and all the sort of politics and questions around um, in San Francisco. So I think it's, it's actually sort of... Um, so I would at this point like to start things off by please, what? Even if it's not necessarily in, um, in the suburbs. This may be outside of your portfolio, but, but, but is there anything that is predictive uh, that you see, I mean, based upon... You're, I guess, retrospectively looking at this sort of move to the suburbs and the sort of change in values from a a a group of people within the Democratic Party and identify themselves as liberals, which sort of because they had outsized influence on the Democratic Party, which I imagine is a function of both like 
the amount of money that they have and um, and perhaps something to do with their lifestyle. They had access to to uh, they were not as sort of crowded, and so the, the, the amount of influence, right? I mean, you get a representative from your state. Uh, and you may have more access to them just because there's not as many people around, it seems to me. Um, yeah, I mean, go ahead. I think that that's, no, I think that that's absolutely, and that's one of the things that makes Massachusetts slightly sort of, um, distinctive in that it's so small, and so you see this amount, I mean, I, and I found this a lot in the, when I was looking um, at the, the archives and, and papers of organizations, but a lot of them had personal connections to, um, many of the kind of representatives and things like that. That does give you a particular amount of power. You can see those those, those, those relationships become more concentrated. But I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no. Uh, they so they so. Is there anything that's that's predictive? I mean, in other words, can you get a sense of where any trends are happening? I mean, uh, now that you know those folks are now uh, theoretically, I guess, in their sixties and seventies, right? Um, and w- w- what is happening? I mean. Where do you get the sense that the the Democratic Party is moving? Is it still following that same trajectory, or has it changed? I think it's very much still following this this trend. I mean, I think that's one thing you've seen um, over the the emphasis that Obama that the key words in many of Obama's particularly campaign speeches that have put a, put a strong emphasis on um, high tech growth um, and um, and ideas of kind of opportunity and, um, and, and sort of, but not necessarily these kinds of meaningful sort of structural, these questions of kind of structurally changing the economy, um, and which is, which has made him very popular both in, um, I mean, in both the kind of suburban communities that I look at, but also in sort of the more, these more, these I think sort of urban, um, urban based areas. And I think that, um, I think that that's something that'll probably continue to increase. And I think that this is both a, it's a source of, of the sort of creative class tech community, the source of, of both influence and then also financial influence on the party. So we'll see more of that, more of that happening. Lily Geismer, uh, the book is uh, Don't Blame Us, Suburban Liberals and the Transformation of the Democratic Party. Thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. It was great to talk to another Massachusetts native. Indeed. All right. So, so long.